Introductions real quick. My name's Lewis McDonald. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Ballyasney Asset Management in New York. And uh, this here is Ethan Stone. Ballyasney Asset Management, where we work, is a global multi-strategy investment firm, financial investment firm. Based in Chicago, Ethan and I uh, come from our New York office. And we are two small parts of our core data platform team. So our mission at Ballyasney is um, to really help people at the firm be successful with data, our data tools. We're, we're an enablement team. We're trying to make it easy, trying to make our systems reliable, frictionless, easy to work with, trying to keep our end users happy. Our, our purpose at the firm is, is really partnering with our front office investment teams who make investment decisions, as well as over 400 technologists on the back end, analysts, engineers, data scientists, ML research scientists, really across the kind of software and AI, ML data spectrum, uh, we have it all. And, and, and in general, we use Airflow, we use DBT, we use probably every other little data technology under the sun um, for a bunch of different workflows. And, and today our, our goal is to help you understand how we um, have fused together Airflow with DBT um, to, to help those different sets of personas and characters that we work with and help enable it at BAM to be successful with their pipelines. So I like to sort of give a little bit of an intro context on what the architecture looks like at Ballyasney where we work. So this is hopefully a diagram that's something similar to what a lot of you folks, um, what a lot of you folks work with and, and, and are familiar with. But you know, as an investment firm, we ingest thousands of data sources on the left-hand side: web scrapes, vendor content, market data, data from financial exchanges, websites, wherever we have a lot of it. Our standard pipelines, you know, catalog and extract that data often in a parquet kind of lake format and, uh, and store that in, in, in S3 with, with a kind of hive meta to store or glue, different, different things that we catalog it with. And then downstream, people consume that data. So some of our data consumers just consume that cataloged raw data from the lake directly. Other times, we, we kind of push some standard transformations and materializations and stages on it. Other times, you know, those transformations are, are much deeper and they go through several really deep layers of transformations. Oftentimes, uh, those different sets of transformations or layers might even be owned by different teams. You know, some team might own some initial enrichments or mappings and further downstream investment teams might own more. And so what I really wanted to, what we're going to dive into in this, in this presentation is, is this area here, really, transformations. So with these sizes of DAGs, uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of um, stuff to maintain. And to start with, I wanted to just give a quick like, zoom in and show you actually what some of these transformation DAGs really, really look like today. So here they are. That's them in all their production glory. Um, not really, but we do have thousands of these interwoven and complex data workflows and pipelines. They're ever growing. They have SQL operators. They have other operators. They have fun operators. They have everything under the sun you can imagine. One of the fun interdependencies that hopefully you guys have never seen this pattern of sort of like one DAG scheduled at 5 a.m., one scheduled at 5.06 a.m., waiting for that other one to be finished and hoping it's finished. Data sets and some things help us, but you know, there's a lot. It's, it's difficult to understand. It's difficult to untangle, organize, and make transparent. It's also difficult for our internal users to test changes sometimes to these DAGs, especially when there's complex interwoven dynamic dependencies between things. Testing is difficult. And we never want to be this guy on the right where we're just saying YOLO, let's put something in prod and test it there. And then, and then lastly, I kind of am alluded to this, but a lot of the stages of our transformational pipeline were a relatively big organization. And so a lot of the stages of our transformation pipeline are owned by different teams and personas. And uh, in, in a legacy situation, sometimes the handoff or the dovetail, the collaboration between those teams has friction. It's difficult for teams with different skill sets, different priorities, different ownership, different styles of, of, of using technology to collaborate. And so these are a bunch of the problems that we've been trying to solve. So for those problems, I wanted to introduce a new technology, DBT. I know this is an Airflow Summit, but just real quick, how many people in the, in the room use or know what DBT is? Everyone, great, love it. And how many of you all use DBT in production? Well, still, most people. Great, that's awesome. Um, so you already know I'm preaching to the choir. This, um, th those problems I outlined are in large part or in some ways often solved by DBT as a framework. Uh, for the small number of you who aren't aware, DBT is an open source framework that basically helps you manage transformations with SQL. It allows teams who collaborate and manage lots of SQL transformations to manage them more effectively. 
manage them with more robust DevOps and GitOps pipelines, but tries not to get in the way and tries to still make it pretty easy to iterate quickly and to roll out changes and to manage your pipelines and manage your, your kind of models with as little friction as possible. And in general, you know, helps us go from this tangled mess of wires to something that looks a little bit prettier on the right. So to restate, if, those, if the first problems of things being messy, things being hard, collaboration were our first problems, and we think DBT as a framework can, can help, then, then I'd maybe slightly restate the problem statement that, that Ethan and I are trying to talk to you about, which is how can we make it easier for people at Bally Asney to use DBT core in production? And that's really, that's really been our mission with, with what we're trying to talk to you about. And, and to clarify what we, really, what we really mean there, how can we make it easy? That means to us simple and fast to get started, low friction, low kind of configuration burden, low paper cuts on getting started. People at BAM, those are engineering teams, data analysts, and everything across the spectrum, so that multiple personas. And importantly, because of the industry in which we operate, multi-tenant security and isolation is, is really a critical requirement for us that we'll go into. And in production, you know, it's not okay at, at our scale managing billions of dollars in assets to, um, you know, just push things into production and hope it works. We need robust production monitoring, observability, uh, we run a, a, a massive fleet of, of Kubernetes clusters and um, you know, have, have strict security requirements with things like Vault to pull and inject credentials. So what have we built and what are we going to show you that we built to solve this problem? Some self-service project bootstrapping uh, integrated with our inter internal developer platform to help get started with a DBT project. A wrapper around the fantastic Cosmos open source library uh, for running and, and, and scheduling those DBT projects in production in, in Airflow. And a build, release, deploy pipeline that kind of helps us, helps us really tightly integrate and couple those two things. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to engineer extraordinaire Ethan uh, to go through some of the more technical specifics. That is my actual title, by the way, in Slack and everything, so. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys a 30 second overview to the architecture um, for how we go from a DBT project locally, doing DBT runs, to all the way into Airflow, into Kubernetes, and into our data warehouse. Lots of cameras out, I love it. This is, this is a great graph. So we start over here in our uh, GitHub repos, which are provisioned using an internal developer platform, um, and it comes with all the nice bits of DBT, all the nice bits of Airflow already there set up for you. We provide a um, build pipeline for the DPT repo, which will compile and push the DPT manifest, which we'll get into later, um, into blob storage to be pulled down later. We also build and push our Docker container to a Docker registry, which contains all of your DBT code um, to be ran later. After that, we have a wrapper library around the open source Cosmos library, and this essentially will turn our DBT manifest and translate it into an Airflow task group. And then the Airflow task group um, correlates to our Kubernetes pod. So each task will map to a pod and run your DBT models. And then those are what are actually doing the transformations in the data warehouse. So that's our quick um, overview for what's going on. Um, so now we're gonna do a demo, a bunch of little record recordings. Um, going through zero to hero, our local DBT to uh, production Airflow. So just to preface, there's gonna be three data sets and we're gonna do some transformations on it, build and push, and then write a DAG and run our DBT projects in Airflow. Um, so our data set, just to be familiar with it, we're gonna be using Snowflake. Um, we have some auto-generated data here. Um, there's gonna be three tables. One is the talks table, which is a bunch of talks that people can go to, which we have here, talk name, a presenter ID, and a talk date. After that, we have a people table. I promise this is auto-generated. You're not in this data set, um, unless you are. The most important column here is talk ID, and this is a list of talks that people uh, went to. That is an important one there. And then our last table is going to be YouTube videos, whenever I decide to run the select star. And so we have talk ID, which the talk is posted to YouTube, and then it has a view count. Um, for how many views that talk got while on YouTube. Um, so that's our data set. We're gonna do some transformations on it now. So first, this is a DBTS thing, which I think all of you are familiar with. You have to define your sources. Um, so the sources are the data sets that I just showed you in Snowflake. And so you're going to define a sources and then each of our tables. So here we have our people table with all of the columns that we saw before. 
And then we have our talks table, again, with all the same columns. And we're going to also specify the YouTube video table. So again, this is just a DVT thing to specify our um, original data sets and that we, so that we can uh, reference them later. And then here we're gonna write some intermediate SQL. So we're gonna go into the staging um, folder, and this is where we're gonna write some SQL that we're gonna use to build on top of. So first, we're gonna create a flattened attendees SQL file. This is me typing in real speed, by the way. And just some basic SQL, we're gonna select and, and flatten out our um, people table to see which talks we went to. Um, and then after that, this is another DVT-esque thing. Um, we have to define our models. So we just created a new model here, and now we're gonna define what it looks like with the columns and descriptions as well. So after that, we have defined a model, we've defined our sources, and we're able to do dbt run. And this is the dbt CLI, and it will run our models and throw them into Snowflake as a view by default. And so then we open Snowflake, and you see here, we now have a view called flattened attendees, which was the name of the uh, SQL file that we defined, and we're able to select star from it. And you can see this is uh, um, some of the data whenever I run it. Not super important for now, just an uh, intermediate step, but just to show you that you're able to write SQL, dbt run, and then it shows up in Snowflake, which is super cool. Now we're gonna make another intermediate table called attendee count per talk, which will give us some insight to how many people showed up to each talk. And so there's some important dbt bits here. You can see source and ref. Source is referencing our talks table, and ref is referencing our previous um, model that we just created. So you can see how there's dependencies between the models, and we can start building this lineage graph between models. Now we're just specifying the attendee count per talk as well. Now we're gonna go into our marks. This is our final, our final model that all of this data that we have is leading to that we can gain insights from. And it's called popularity.sql. And this is gonna tell us the most popular talks at the Airflow Summit. And so again, I wanna point your attention to the um, ref and source, referencing the YouTube videos, referencing our previous model. And then we're able to, oh sorry, we have to uh, specify our model still for this one as well. Every time we make a new model, we need to specify what it looks like in YAML. And we do that here. And then now we're gonna be able to do dbt run. It's just off, but I am typing it. And that will run our now three models with our um, important one being popularity.sql. And all those models now exist in Snowflake. Takes a second to run. And so now in Snowflake, you'll be able to see in our views, we have three tables, flattened attendees, attendee count per talk, and popularity. And so whenever I select from the popularity, you'll see that Michael Juster and our talks are the two most popular at the Airflow conference. It's really cool, building on Cosmos and Kubernetes. Um, and then here's just a cool little plugin to show some of the lineage. Whenever you click on a file, it will show the models that depend on it and the models that it depends on. Um, so that's just a cool little bit there. So that's the local dbt um, process, which most of you are familiar with. Write some models, write some YAMLs, dbt run, and the views show up in Snowflake. So now, how do we get this into Airflow? The intermediate step here is building and deploying. So we need to be able to get our dbt project into the Docker registry and in a manifest file. And a quick stop, a manifest file is how dbt internally represents the dependencies between models. So we're able to read this manifest file and see, oh, model two depends on model one, model five depends on model two and three. So real quick, uh, with our um, provisioned repo, we have a bunch of nice little pre-commit checks, um, and we're gonna push our code to GitHub. Nice important step to deploy your code. We're gonna tag a release. These releases are immutable, so each version of the project is not gonna change once we've um, given it a tag. And this will automatically kick off a deploy process in Jenkins, which is essentially doing the second step of what we talked about earlier, which is turning the GitHub um, dbt repo into a manifest and into a Docker container to run, to be used later in Airflow. So now, how do we, now that we've done the build and deploy process, how do we run this in Airflow? So here, again, real-time speed of me typing. We've defined some basic DAG, presets, retries, all the nice stuff, we've named our DAG, and then here we're filling out something called the BAMflow DBT task group. 
And so what that's doing is this is our wrapper around Cosmos. And in it, you have to specify a project connection ID, which we'll get to uh, just after this. And with the connection ID, you're able to turn your DBT project and its lineage graph, so in our graph we had three models which depended on each other, and it will turn it into a task group of Kubernetes operators to run in Kubernetes. So here is me filling out the connection. And again, that was, I, I actually forgot to say this, but this is like literally five lines of code outside of the, the DAG definition, which can be verbose. But literally one task group, bang, bang, and that can run a million size large DBT graph if you wanted to. So extremely simple to transform it from DBT into DAG code. So how we do this is we use Airflow connections and we created our own custom DBT um, connection, again, wrapping around the Cosmos library. And in it, we have to specify the project name, which in our case was Summit Demo, and the project version, which in our case was 0.0.3. .0 and with that, it knows where to reach out to find the manifest and blob storage, and it knows where to find the Docker container in our Docker registry. Um, again, with a couple more of these, which can be automated eventually. And then, we're able to click run on our DAG, and we can see this is, well, we can see this is our lineage graph that we saw earlier in the DBT project. So each, each model that we had in our DBT project is now a task in Airflow, and they're running as a Kubernetes pod operator. So in Airflow we have, or sorry, in DBT we have the select, um, the select model, and we can run one model at a time, and that's essentially the, the difference between these is dbt run select the model. So yeah, that's a, a front to back, that's a front to back how you can write some dbt, or write some SQL in dbt, specify your, your sources, your models, push it up to blob storage, Docker registry, and then pull it down using the connection to run your dbt as an Airflow DAG. So now we're gonna do a couple of deep dives into some of the bits that we glossed over. So number one is how do we go from the dbt manifest to an Airflow task group? Um, so this mostly is um, the open source Cosmos library, as I've alluded to a couple of times. Um, this is written by an astronomer and works super duper well, but it, it parses the manifest file, um, which is dbt's representation of lineage between, and dependencies between models, and turns it into a task group. This comes with a lot of uh, nice bits. So rather than running your entire DBT project as one task, you're now able to split it up into multiple and you're able to have all the good things that comes with um, task dependencies, such as upstream failures um, and being able to rerun subsets of your DBT project. It's also composable. So if you wanted to have a true ELT, you can have your extract as a task, your load as a task, and then DBT as your transform task. And, and you're able to have your DBT project as a task group after other extract and load parts of your DAG, which is super duper cool. So deep dive number two is how we um, get the manifest. So basically, rather than every time the DAG runs, reaching out to blob storage and pulling that manifest down and parsing it, we use our own custom dbt connection to, um, to pull it and then cache it in memory. And so that way, we don't have to uh, bring it down and parse it every single time we run. So the scheduler um, sees the connection change whenever we update the version, and then it gets the new, the manifest and data, and is able to translate it into that task group. So the number three is the Kubernetes execution. So as I said before, the task group gets generated, and then each task will correlate one-to-one -one with a Kubernetes pod operator. Um, so this, you know, to motivate this discussion, um, at BAM, we have a very extensive Kubernetes footprint. It's our essentially one-stop shop for uh, running processes, and we have a lot of integrations, um, security integrations, monitoring, and so it was very natural for us to want to use uh, Kubernetes as our mode of execution. Cosmos does allow locals, um, it allows Docker, it allows Azure, and a bunch of other things, but as a Kubernetes shop, we. Uh, easy to do Kubernetes. And so credentials are injected upon runtime to interact with the warehouse. Um, we have great vault integration with our Kubernetes cluster, thanks to the cloud team. And so it makes running our pods on Kubernetes extremely easy. Yeah, just to, to summarize, I guess, what, it, what Ethan has already shown. Yeah, the benefits of, of this versus our um, spaghetti code or all those DAGs that, you showed at the, uh, that we showed at the start. Um, simple config, you know, this, this library 
um, requires really at its baseline and in, in like the default really simple case, almost no parameters. It's really simple to run. It doesn't require you to express um, a big complex DAG, but you still get the transparency and lineage and full kind of visibility and production visibility into all of those individual tasks. We're even planning on creating like a, a further wrapper um, that requires basic users with, just using dbt not to really even know that Airflow exists at all, not to have to write that DAG because really it's so simple. Um, the Kubernetes stuff is simple. We've answered a bunch of questions there. Um, and the other part, uh, if you remember, we're a platform team. It's really our, our goal and our mission to keep things consistent, well managed, integrated with all of our general tooling around the platform ecosystem at BAM. And so by having this shared provider, we can add in things like metrics, observability, egress lineage to our uh, data catalog. Uh, we're creating a centralized dbt documentation hub so that these things can opt into publishing their docs that are available internally. Um, and really sort of define and, and standardize the golden path of how people use dbt at BAM to keep things easy, maintainable, and avoid getting into that tangled cable mess uh, that we showed on the first slide. So, um, future a few steps, uh, the Cosmos team and the open source folks we've discussed with a lot um, you know, have some really interesting ideas to speed up some of the execution problems in Kubernetes and there's, there's aspects of the Airflow 3 roadmap which I think map really nicely to helping decouple control plane and runtime execution and some of the things we're kind of achieving with the Kubernetes operators um, here. Um, there's also a bunch more stuff that I'm sure people who know more about Cosmos than us do, uh, can, can talk to you guys about. Um, but you know, Cosmos was was started like I don't know, like a year ago or something. And it's been it's been great. Uh, uh, so I know there's an extensive roadmap there that the team are working on. And so with that, thank you.